Hi, everybody. How is everyone today? I'm down in Miami, nice and hot and sticky and warm. I'm gonna give Kelly a second here to get his thing all set up. If you're joining, let me know where you are in the country. And if you wanna know about me, I'll talk about myself now. Um, I own the Addictions Academy and the Addictions Coach, and we do classes for people that wanna learn recovery coaching or intervention. We do classes for counselors. We do classes for family coaches. We are the largest online addictions academy, addictions studies in the world. We're in 22 countries. We're in five languages. We have 40 classes. And we also have 20 plus teachers all over the world. So that's been fun. Uh, it's been fun translating our courses into different languages and getting to meet different people around the world as they learn about us. And I'm also the addictions coach, so I deal with high profile individuals, I deal with F, uh, NFL players, I deal with NBA actors, actresses, CEOs, my favorite of course are the musicians, I'm married to a musician who's a drummer, so I love my musician guys, I've been on tour a few times helping them get sober, and one of my passions that I do with my clients is once you're sober, what do you do now? And if you'll notice behind me, I'm in the RV, I'm in the tour bus. And I travel around and I see clients. I have a signature product called Sober On Demand where they come on the bus and we boondock and I help them get sober. So there's a lot of different things I do outside the box and I meet my client right where they are. So if you're in recovery and you're just joining, know that there's no one way to get sober. There's many different paths of recovery. You might go to NA, you might go to NA, you might do something different. You might go to Smart Recovery, you might go to Celebrate Recovery, you might get sober on a yoga mat, that's what I did. I had a food addiction that turned into a pill addiction. When I was young, I went to the doctor and I said, I think I have a problem with food, and he sent me to the fat doctor who put me on Fen Fen and some other lovely speed products, and I ended up addicted to speed. So I got sober on a yoga mat, I got sober in a gym, I had to learn how to eat, I had to learn how to work out, lots of things I didn't know. So one of the things I do with my clients is a little bit of everything. I meet them right where they are, wherever they are to help them get sober, and I give them every possible tool I have. But the one thing they ask me is now what? I've gone to treatment, I've gotten sober, and I come home, what do I do now? So I have a podcast called Unpause Your Life, which is what now? How do I get from I'm clean and sober to recovered? Because they're very different things. People say all the time, well, I'm in recovery. And I say, are you doing the same bad behaviors you were when you were using? And they say sometimes. And I say, then you're not in recovery. You're clean and sober. Recovered means you've changed your bad behaviors. You have changed the things that you were doing that hurt other people. So if you're in the 12 steps and you've done your fourth step and you've made amends, you shouldn't be hurting anyone else. But a lot of people say, but what else? What else should I be doing? And I say, have you been living your true purpose? Have you been living your passion? Are you doing the things that you want to do in life? Are you merely just getting up and going to work and existing? And that's where I spend 99% of my time helping a client get sober. Because addiction isn't the problem. Addiction is the solution to the problem. Let me say that again. Addiction isn't the problem. Addiction is the solution to the problem. So my question is, what is the problem? What is causing someone to do drugs or alcohol or overindulge in food or go gambling or Shop on Amazon. Everyone has Amazon Prime. Everyone's addicted to the internet now too. Facebook likes. What is it that you have to have? What is it that you are overindulging in to the point where it is ruining your life? I have a client 
that lost his job because he spends so much time on Instagram posting selfies that he gets up and he spends four hours to five hours a day getting the most perfect like. He's stuck. He's completely stuck. He's sober. His drug of choice was meth. He hasn't used meth in two years. Totally sober, but he's addicted to Instagram and Facebook. So how do we get past this? How do we get unstuck? How do we move forward? Well, step one is get sober. Step one is get off the drugs, get off the alcohol, get off the phone, if that is your issue, get out of the casino. That's step one. Step one is get it under control. But then what? What do we do now? If you're stuck in life, if you're stuck in career, how do I get out and unstick myself? And that's the question my clients ask me. So I'm gonna give you four tips today. Feel free to write these down. And I'm also gonna give away at the end a copy of my best-selling workbook. I have a workbook that has 45 exercises in it for anybody to move forward and unstick yourself. So if you would like a copy of the workbook, I'm giving away a copy for free. Please let me know. It's also on Amazon if you want to purchase a copy. But I'm gonna give you four tips and tricks that are not in this workbook. So start with number one. In a nutshell, here we go. Who am I? If I ask you who you are, the question becomes, what do I do versus who I am? So when I ask somebody who you are, this is what I get. I'm an addict. I'm a mom. I'm a sober companion. I'm an accountant. I'm a doctor. I never hear who they are. That's what you do. Who you are is I'm fun. I'm energetic. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm loving. I'm caring. I'm funny. That's who you are not what you do. So my first thing with clients is I say to get you unstuck, you have to know who you are. And I give them an activity. And I ask them to come up with 25 ways that they can describe who they are to someone. So if you imagine yourself on a first date and you imagine sitting there across from someone and they say, tell me about you. And you answer, you wanna tell them about you. You wanna to talk to them about yourself. You don't want to tell them, I'm an addict, I'm a mom, I'm a nurse. Okay, that's boring. That's great, but it's boring. Who really are you? I want to get to know you. So that's the very, very first thing. So if any of you have any comments or questions, please feel free, hop in, ask me something. I'll be more than happy to answer it. I see Stephanie's looking for some help with her son. Stephanie, give me a call, 1-800-706-0318. I'll post that on here as well. Give me a call and see if I can help you. So that's step one, is figuring out who you are. Now there's a lot of young people, we call them failure to launch. They are stuck. They don't know who they are. They don't know how to move forward. They don't know how to get out of their own way. So we're hearing that all the time. I'm stuck. I don't wanna make a million dollars, but I don't wanna get up and go to work. How do I get out of my own way? How do I get a job? How do I do these things that I'm supposed to do and not feel the way I feel. And that's step one. They don't know who they are. A lot of times with our young people, we've had some problems because in school, we give them awards. You get an award for being in and graduating elementary. You get an award for being in and graduating middle school. You get an award for being in and graduating high school. Nobody gets cut from football. Nobody gets cut from cheerleading. They are failure to launch. So how do we move forward with them? Well, number one is figuring out who they are. Who are they? And they're stuck there. They don't know who they are. So that's step one. Let's sit down and figure out who we are as a person and what we like. Do you like sushi? Do you like to go to the gym? Do you like pizza? These are all things that give you a broader picture of who you are and what you wanna do. Now that's step one. Step two is what is my purpose in life? What am I supposed to be doing? A lot of people in recovery didn't start out as an addictions coach or a counselor or a therapist. They started out with being an accountant. They started off with being a doctor and something happened and their addiction took over. And when their addiction took over, they lost 
what they thought was their identity. But they hated their job. They hated doing what they, they were actually doing. I have a client that said, I'm an accountant and I hate it. My dad was an accountant. His dad was an accountant. It was expected for me to be an accountant. I said, what do you want to do? He said, I want to be a pastor. I said, what's the problem? He said, my family would never accept me. So every day he did heroin because he didn't like what he did. That was not his purpose. His purpose was not to be an accountant. His purpose was to be a pastor. However, no one ever encouraged him to do that. And that became the problem. Yolanda, you'd love a book? Beautiful. Hit me up on Facebook. I'll send you one. So when that happened to him, he shut down and he did drugs and he hid from the world. And that's what happens with your purpose. If you don't know what your purpose is and you don't know how to expand upon your purpose, you end up stuck. You're stuck in a job. You're stuck where you don't want to be. You're stuck in a relationship. You hate everything around you and you wake up and you don't want to go to work. And you don't want to be anymore sometimes because it's frustrating. So that's where the purpose and passion comes in. Am I content in my job? Am I content in what I'm doing? How do I change these things? Is my mission being fulfilled? And if not, how do I get there? There's an exercise on purpose and passion that you can do in the workbook. And you sit down and you list all the things you like about yourself and all the things you want to change. And you list all the activities you do and all the activities you want to change. And you take a look at it and say, where do I want to go? Where are the things I enjoy? How do I get there? So you have to know who you are. You have to figure out your purpose and passion in life. And then the next one, which is very important, is tribe. You have to know who your squad or your tribe or your crew is. If you don't know that, you're not with like-minded people. The, the saying is, tell me who you hang around with and I'll tell you who you are. Tell me who you hang around with and I'll tell you who you are. Your circle dictates who you are. You become just like the closest five people around you. If they sit around and eat pizza and play Xbox, you will sit around and eat pizza and play Xbox. If they're out making millions of dollars, you will make millions of dollars. So there's all those things that are happening. Bobby Scott, awesome. Congrats on the time clean. Contact me. I will help you figure out who you are. So when you're picking your tribe, you have to know who you are first, what your purpose is, and then those are the types of people you have to attract. You have to be around and with the people that you emulate, the people that you want to be like, the people that you feel important to, the people that you want to learn from. You become them. So if you hang around, and there's an exercise called Circle of Influence in my workbook. And that's the workbook, Circle of Influence. And I want to show it to you for a second because it's really neat. And you can do this without buying the workbook. And you can do it on a piece of paper. And it looks like a bullseye. It's actually very, very cool. I had it earmarked and I lost it on you. Um, it's called Circle of Influence. Here it is. Looks like this. So it's me in the center because you're the center of your universe. And then in the smaller circle around you right here are your closest friends and then less close and then way out here. And what happens is the people closest to you are the people that you associate with on a daily basis. They're the people that you talk to every day. You text, you call, you get to know. The next circle are the people that Maybe you see at work or you pass here and there. And maybe the, the person who creates your coffee, the barista at Starbucks, those are a little farther out. And then way, way out there are the people on Facebook or the people you talk to once a year or Aunt I know that you only see at Christmas. So that's your circle of influence. If you sit down and make that circle and you look and see the people closest to you, those are the people that you will emulate and be like. Most CEOs have no inner circle because there's no time for those close interpersonal relationships. 
they're busy doing 101 things. So they have a lot of people they know, but very few or one or two trusted sources. So you have all these different people. Now, in accordance with this, you also have toxic friends. What happens when you have toxic people around you? Well, if you're in recovery and you're hanging out with somebody smoking meth and meth is your drug of choice, what happens? You end up smoking meth nine times out of 10, you relapse because those people around you become your people. Thank you, Higgy. Higgy just shared us uh, to his group, um, No More Heroin. Awesome. So if anybody wants to share us, please do. Good information, get it out there. So you become the people you hang around with. The more people you hang around with that are toxic, you become like them. So if you have a child or a loved one that, that's not sober, that you're trying to get sober, the first thing you have to look at is their circle of influence. Who do they hang around with? Are those people sober? Are they clean? Now, if they're sober and clean and they're still sitting at home playing Xbox and eating pizza, they're not living their life to their full potential, which was number two on our list, purpose and passion. So you want your loved one to have a circle of friends that are working towards a goal and fulfilling their purpose and passion in life. They're not just sitting around going, oh boy, I want to do it, but I don't know how to do it. They're doing it. And to do it, you have to jump without a parachute. You have to fly. You have to try. You have to fail. Because that's how things go. We try, we fail. We get up, we do it again. And again and again until we figure it out. That is your tribe. Your tribe has to be like you. And I'll give you another adage. So there's three types of people in the world. Tuna, shark, and dolphin. I love this saying. So in your circle of influence, if there's a shark, a shark wants what you have. They don't want to pay you. They don't want to compensate you, but they want what you have. So for example, they may order your service and they may purchase your service. And then they will call you after they've done your entire service and tell you that it was absolute garbage and they want a refund. Why? They don't want to pay you. They can, but they don't want to. Then you have tuna. Tuna want what you have, but can't pay you. This is the person who never seems to be able to hold a job. This is the person next door who borrows the lawnmower, then the weed whacker, then a cup of sugar, and you can't seem to get any of your stuff back because they just don't feel that it's necessary. They're almost like a lazy group of people. They're stuck, but they don't really want to be unstuck. Then you have dolphin. Dolphin want what you have, but they have something to give you. Time, love, energy, trading of product. They want to barter. They want to be part of your inner circle. So when I'm teaching this, I say with your circle of influence, remember we have three levels here. Everybody in the center should be a dolphin that you're working with. Nobody should be a shark or a tuna. So when you're creating your circle of influence, you want people that are like-minded. This is your tribe. This is your squad. This is your crew. You want people that share your vision and you want to share their vision and you want to help each other. You really, really want to pick each other up on a consistent basis. What happens is people gravitate towards negativity and drama. And I'm gonna pause for one second. People like negative, they like drama. They want to see you fail. If I could tell you the amount of people that want to see me fail on a daily basis, it's probably in the thousands. Why? Because they don't want to do the hard work it takes to get here. This took a lot of work to get where I am and they don't want to do it. I've even had one major competitor on national television slander me all over the internet. Why? He's not a dolphin. He's a shark. He doesn't want to get there. I don't want him in my circle because I will become like him and I don't want to be like him. So when I'm teaching your tribe, you have to find your like-minded people. You have to find the people that are like you and not necessarily look like you, but have the same moral compass. Moral compass meaning you have the same ideas and you have the same goals in life. You know kind of where you wanna go. So the first one is who am I? How do I figure, it, figure out who I am? Number two, purpose. How do I find my purpose and passion in life? How do I get there? And I hear Julie, 
Congratulations, three and a half years clean, and you're still finding yourself. You will. There are certain things you can do to find yourself, Julie and Bobby. Make a list of all the attributes you have that you like about yourself. It's a positive and negative list. Here are my positives, here are my negatives. This is another activity in this workbook. And take a look at your positives. Every morning when you wake up, you read those positives out loud to yourself. And as you start to do that, your self-confidence goes up. When confidence goes up, you're more apt to see all the opportunities around you and very well grab one of those and move forward. So you have that. You also have to figure out what it is you want to do. What's next in life? Where am I going next? Which brings me to my fourth thing, creating a vision board. Creating a vision board is how to get from being stuck to unstuck. So here we go. You create a big board and you write on it every day and you come up with four or five ideas, four or five things you want to do. Eli is in Norway. Awesome. Welcome. Um, you can go on Amazon or you can contact me privately and I'll send you a copy. Very easy. You can get a downloadable on Kindle or you can get a hard copy. So going back to this vision board. Bobby and Julie, you need a vision board. To get from point A to point B, think of it as a roadmap. If you were gonna set off on a trip, and I don't know where you guys are, what part of the country you're in, I'm in Miami. If I wanna get from Miami to LA, the first thing I'm gonna do is sit down and figure out my, my direction. Am I gonna take 40 across the state? Am I gonna take 10? Will I fly? Will I drive? Will I drive the RV? Then I figure out how much is it going to cost me in gas, in time? Do I need hotels? Do I need a driver, right? I'm planning my trip. We never do this with our lives. We get up in the morning and we go, okay, what am I gonna do today? Creating a vision board is going, I wanna get from Miami to LA and I wanna figure out how to do it. So on my board, I put Miami and I put LA. And then I come up with all the points to get there. Am I gonna fly? Am I gonna drive? How much is it gonna cost? And I spell it out on a board. And when I do that, I can see the path to get there. With your life, it's the same thing. You sit down and say, what do I really wanna do? If I can do anything, money, time is not an issue. What do I wanna do? And let's say you wanna be a pilot. Okay, you put that on your vision board. And then you sit down and figure out how, you want to, how you're gonna to get to being a pilot. Where do I have to go to school? How many hours? How much does it cost? How do I figure it out? And you start the pre-planning process to become a pilot. It's really that simple. It sounds huge. Addicts in recovery take too much on every time. What we do is we say, okay, I want a new car, a new apartment, and I need a new job, right? I want all of these three things tomorrow. And I say, how much money do you have in your bank account? And they say zero. Okay, well with zero, you can't get the car and you can't get the apartment tomorrow, but we can get the job. That's a starting point. So our vision board has to be job first, then what? Car next, apartment next, what's important? And how are we gonna get there? How much do we need for a down payment on a car? How much do we need for a down payment on an apartment? Where do you wanna live? That is your vision board. So if you start with who am I, and you figure out who you are, then you figure out your purpose. What am I supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to be a nurse? I saw Nisha log on here. Nisha's a nurse. She would always talk about blood and guts, which I can't stand. That's her thing. She loves it. I can't stand it. I see Jenny Fontana on here. She's a nutritionist. She talks about eating healthy and what foods work for which drugs to restore your body. That's their purpose in life. I could never be a nurse, but that's their purpose and they're filling, fulfilling that. My purpose is different. I didn't just wake up one day and go, I'm gonna be an addict and I'm gonna be you know, doing all this work to help other addicts. I woke up and said, I wanna be an FBI agent and that wasn't in the cards for me. So figuring out how to get there is in the vision board. So. Bobby and Julie sit down and plan. Here I am and here's where I wanna be. And how do I get there? How do I put the steps necessary to get there? 
time, money, energy, effort, schooling. What do I need as a package? How many things do I need? So those are your four majors in getting unstuck when you're stuck because being stuck is extremely uncomfortable. And sometimes people say, I don't know how to get out of being unstuck. And they talk about being stuck. The more times you talk negatively, the more negative you become, the more negative you are. Think about that. If you wake up in the morning and you go, I hate my life. Your entire day now has been set to, I hate my life. And it's a negative connotation. But if you wake up and you say, I'm so excited to be alive today, I'm grateful to be alive, and I'm gonna have the best possible day I can, you will set the tone for the day. And you might have a few hiccups throughout the day, but you trudge through those and you move to the other side. When you get to the other side, you say, okay, this was a great day, or it was a so-so day. And I had a little bit of this and a little bit of that that was great, and you move out to the next thing. Yes, Bobby, positive energy, absolutely, law of attraction, you get what you put out. Remember your five closest friends. Think about that. In your circle of influence, we talked about, if you have your five closest friends are negative, you will be negative. It's that simple. You have to be around positive people. You have to be around people that are going up, not going down. Everybody has that one family member that's you don't want to deal with, right? You go to Thanksgiving dinner, you go to Christmas, and a lot of people just want to get drunk or high not to deal with, you know, Aunt Edna. I have one of those, believe it or not. And every time I see her, she looks at me and she looks me up and down and she goes, hmm, you gained weight, honey. You know what? As soon as I started to realize that wasn't about me, it was about her and her negativity. And I said, I'm not going to own your negativity. I'm not going to take your negativity. So as soon as I did that, I said, this is about you. You have a problem with how you look and you feel fat and you've now projected that on me. So when that happened, I started to realize my self-confidence when in the very beginning would go down and I look in the mirror and say, wow, oh my God, am I fat? She really, she's right, I gained weight. But instead of listening to the negativity, I said, I don't wanna be around you. I shut her down and I walked to the other side of the room and I said, thank you for your opinion. And I didn't own the negativity because remember the five people that I'm around, I will pick up. And when I did that, I realized it wasn't about her, about me. It was about her. Courtney, the book is called Recovery Coach Workbook. You can get it on Amazon or if you private message me, I can send you a PDF or I can send you a hard copy. So that's part of it. When you say to yourself, I'm stuck and I can't move forward, you have to figure out who you are. And we do that by using adjectives that describe us and that make us feel a certain way. Then we have to figure out what our purpose is. What am I doing? And maybe I'm not doing what I should be doing. Am I living my true potential? Everybody says to me, how can you do all these things? I have the addictionscoach.com for clients, so we help clients. I have the addictionsacademy.com where we help us, people become students, become recovery coaches and interventionists. I have a podcast called Unpause Your Life where we talk about people that have done all these amazing things. And I have a directory now for people that want to find other professionals. I also have a product line coming out. How do I have time to do all of these things? Well, this is my purpose. This is my passion. I wake up every morning and I go, what else can I give the world back? What else can I do to help somebody else? Because when I help you, I feel good. And when I feel good, that, that's awesome to me. And the more people I help, they help other people. And the more I do this, the better I feel. My husband and I have a book coming out. It's called I Married a Junkie. And it's all about our lives of me being doing what I do, marrying somebody that was sober that relapsed. And what was it like for those time period? So for me, it never stops. It's what else can I put out there to help the world? How else can I help somebody else? That's my purpose and passion in life. So your purpose and passion in life changes to those you're around. Bobby just said, 
that I'm in recovery, but I'm surrounded by active addicts, and I'm still maintaining sobriety, but I'm trying to fix them. You can't fix them. That's the first step. You cannot fix other people. They can fix themselves. You can give them a toolbox full of tools to fix themselves, to help themselves. If they don't open the toolbox, they'll never build the house. So you're trying to build the house for them. That's tough. So if you're around active addicts and you're trying to stay sober, you have to come first. You may have to distance yourself from them and say, I've got to work on me first. It's just like when you get on the airplane and they say, you know, when the mask drops from the ceiling and they say, put your mask on first, put your child's mask on second, because if you're not getting oxygen, you can't help them if you're passed out. It's the exact same thing. So when you're surrounded by people like that, you need a break. You also need help. When we get sober, our first instinct is to help and save everybody. And the problem with that is you can't save everybody. They have to want the help. They have to do the work to get the help. And they have to continue to do the work. And sometimes we're too close to the situation. I get calls from family members that say, I need you to fix so-and-so. And I say, I can't, I'm too close to the situation. Let me get you another professional that isn't emotionally attached to the situation. Because once you're attached to the situation, you may make decisions or give advice you normally wouldn't give if you weren't emotionally attached. So that's all part of what is your purpose? What is your passion? And a lot of people get into the addiction industry and they get into helping other people because the career they had before didn't work for them. If you're at work and you're drinking and you're drugging and you're doing all these things, you're not happy. Because remember, my very first comment was addiction is not the problem. Addiction is the solution to a problem. The question becomes, what is your problem? Your problem is, I don't know who I am. I don't know my purpose in life. I'm surrounded by people that are using drugs and alcohol, and I have no idea what vision I want to create. That's why you're using drugs and alcohol or gambling or internet or whatever it is that separates you from what you should be doing. If you feel stuck and you feel you can't get out of your own way, these are some of the tools to start with. So let me cover the activities again. Who am I? Making a list of adjectives that describe yourself. That's the first one. The second one is where do I want to go in my life? Creating a list of things you want to do. Best activity is a bucket list. I had a bucket list when I was 14. And my sister's on listening and she's gonna laugh because this is true. Uh, my stepdad was blue collar. He was a truck driver and a welder. My mom, still to this day, is a film file clerk. She's blue collar. My father never graduated high school. We came from a very poor family. And my stepdad said, what do you wanna do with your life? And at 14, I said, there's four things I want to do. I wanna make a million dollars. And he laughed at me and he said, good luck, okay? I want to live in a house by the beach because we're from Pottstown, which is about two and a half hours from any beach anywhere. And I want to be on the beach. And I accomplished that. I want a brand new car because we never had a brand new car. We always had a car that broke. We always had a car that was in the shop. My mom's, my mom had a Camaro when I was a little kid that had a rusted bottom. And when we'd ride over a puddle, I had to lift my feet up. And I said, I just, I want a new car. I want that new car smell. And I deserve that. And the last one was, I want to find a real man. So this was my goal in life. These were my goals. At 14, I knew I wanted something out of life that the rest of my family told me you don't deserve. In my family, what you do is you meet your high school sweetheart, you marry him, you move two doors down from mom, and that's where you stay. You raise five or six kids, you work a, a retail job, and that's your life. And I said, that's not me. I don't want that. By 30, I had attained three of the four. I had the million, I had the house, I had the new car. And the economic downturn, I lost them all and I was homeless, literally homeless, sleeping in my car in Laguna Beach, California, on the, in Huntington Beach actually, on the, um, right by the pier. And it was like that for about six months. From there, I didn't know what I wanted to do because I'd lost everything. I lost my company, I lost all my stuff and it burned up in a fire. I lost all my money, I was completely broke. And I said, what do I wanna do? 
and I sat down and I created a vision board. And my vision board was to help as many people as I possibly could, through as many channels as I could. So that would be coaching, teaching, public speaking. And when I first set out to do it, I had a lot of negativity. I got people saying to me, you can't do this. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not this, you're not that. And I said, that's all about you, not about me. I'm gonna do it anyway. And I started doing it. And I started pushing to help other people. And I said, by any means necessary to help you get sober. It's no longer just AA and NA. It's no longer just 12 steps. There's other means. And I started doing this. And the more I did it, the better I felt about myself. Because here I am, I'm helping you. And when I was 35, I got married. I got my fourth piece. So I had all four. I lost three of the four. And I got back on my horse and I rode again. And that's the problem that a lot of people encounter is they say, this is what I, I want to do. And a hiccup happens and they don't like the hiccup and they go, oh my God, it's so much work. I had literally nothing. I was in a house with no running water and no heat and no furniture in Christmas in Philadelphia. It's freezing. I picked, put my big girl panties on and I got back in my boat and I started rowing. Sure, the first two months I said, why me? How is this happening? I had my temper tantrum. I threw my phone and I broke it what have you, but I got back in the canoe and I rode. And that's what most addicts don't do when they relapse. They stop and they go, oh my God, my life is over. I don't know what else I'm supposed to be doing. But once you find your purpose and passion, and once you find out who you are, and once you find out the tribe you're supposed to be with, and you create the vision board, and you're in the driver's seat, because when you're using, you're in the passenger seat of the car, not the driver's seat. When you're in the driver's seat, you're in control of your life. When you're in control of your life, now you're going the right direction. That's where you want to get to. Stephanie, you're right. People are afraid of change because change is uncomfortable. But if you're not uncomfortable, you're never going to get where you need to go. Because at some point in your life, you have been uncomfortable. Think about the first job you had. The first day on your job was extremely uncomfortable. You didn't know anybody. They didn't know you. You probably didn't even know where the bathroom was. And you had to ask, where's the bathroom? Where's the coffee machine? Where's my desk? Where's my phone? What am I supposed to be doing? So it was uncomfortable and you got through it and you survived, right? The first date you had with your significant other was uncomfortable. I mean, God, what are we gonna talk about? What if he doesn't like me? What if this, what if that? So those are things that are uncomfortable that we work through. Getting sober is uncomfortable. Remember, I told you in the beginning, my addiction was food. So when I got put on diet pills, I went from 140 pounds to 90 pounds. I loved it. This is awesome. I can still eat all the food I want and lose weight on these diet pills. But then I had to give up the diet pills because it's speed. I went from legal diet pills to illegal diet pills pretty quickly. And when that happened, I got very sick. I almost blew a hole in my heart. I blew my adrenals out. So all these health problems started to happen and I had to quit. I didn't have an option. I didn't want to quit. I went through Kubler Ross's five stages of grief because it was bargaining. How can, why can they have Ben and Jerry's and I can't? Why can this and why can that? And why not me? I went through the whole thing. Then I realized I don't need this. I don't need food to make myself feel better. I don't need diet pills to be thin. I need to make a lifestyle change. And it was uncomfortable because when I detoxed off of sugar and white flour, I was on the floor swearing to God I was going to die. Didn't know why. And back then, this is 20 years ago, there was no detox for white flour and sugar. People just said, okay, you're just fat. Go figure it out. But now we know detoxing off of flour and white sugar is like coming off a of heroin. I had the headaches, I had the stomach cramps, I had the leg cramps, I had the fogginess, I had the anger, I had the adidonia, I had all of that. So I went through the detox and it was uncomfortable and I failed at it and I relapsed and I picked myself back up and did it again and I relapsed and I did it again and eventually I learned this is not the lifestyle I want. I can't function. I'm planning my entire day around working out sucking down speed and doing all the things that are not good for my higher self and i'm helping nobody i'm completely 
destructive. So when I teach clients, you have to be constructive, not destructive. When you're in active addiction, you are destructive. Now it's time to be constructive. So constructive means no more pawning things, no more lying. Finding what you're supposed to be doing in life and moving forward, you're not going to want to lie. You're not going to wake up and go, who can I con out of money today to get my drug? Whether it's food, gambling, I've seen online gaming. I have a kid that spent $100,000 of his mother's money on online gaming. Let that sink in. 100000 of her money on online gaming. So whatever your addiction is, if it is destroying your life, you have to get it under control. But once you get clean and sober, you still have to be recovered. You have to get to the next step of your life. You have to say, what do I do now? What is my next thing? That's one of my specialties with my clients. I like to get them to the next thing. So I'm going to leave you all with a takeaway. I want you all to figure out, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Number one, is your circle of influence a good circle of influence? Are you happy with the people you're around? And what's your vision look like? Where do you want to go? What's the next step from here? Maybe you're clean and sober and recovered and you love your job and now you need a significant other. Start creating that life you want to live. Start creating that next step. That's what I invite you to do. Create your vision board. Figure out your purpose and passion. Make your who am I list. Make your where am I going list. You're welcome, Yolanda. That's what I do. I inspire and I empower my clients to stay sober because they love who they are. And they love what they do. So I'm Dr. Callie Estes. My company is the Addictions Coach or the Addictions Academy. The workbook is here. It's called Recovery Coach Workbook. It's on Amazon. Please hit me up privately. Um, feel free to contact me. I'm at 1-800-706-0318, extension 1. You're all very welcome. I see lots of thank yous. I'm here to empower and inspire and help at any point. That's what I do. And I wish you all a great day. And thank you to Kelly and the Identify Project show for having me on. I really appreciate it. Have a great day, guys.